Good morning to all of you and uh, we see that this is the time to start, 9 o'clock is the time. So even though we expect a lot more people to come, but we will start initiate. So the topic at our hand is driving Cloudlet into OpenStack. So the main, uh, at the end of the session, if you want to carry some message, you remember Cloudlet, Cloudlet, and cloudlet that's the message you need to carry with you given said that uh, since we are here three of us are here i have professor satya mahadevan uh, mahadev satyanarayanan and then we have uh, rolf schuster these two are the fellow one of them is the i call visionary other is the missionary i am the executor on their behalf so that's what we see and all three of us have intel inside us because these are the four people who, who are the vendors like huawei i am from huawei he's from cmu he's from the service provider that is the vodafone and all of us have intel inside and that's the four people are collaborating parties who have come together to drive the cloudlet so i will let uh, just give you introduce a brief introduction not much just to see, I have uh, been, this is my seventh uh, conference here, summit probably, I am the lucky seventh, so I am here on the floor, otherwise on, I always, most of the time I was on the other side. And I am in, located in Santa Clara, and I work for FutureY, that is, which is Huawei R&D, and my, I have been working globally, starting from India to US to China, and I am here in front of you. Hopefully, we will do something good for NFE and SDN, which is our vision for the open edge computing. Dr. Ralf Schuster, he is the head of Innovation Center, Vodafone. He deals with the research. He provides the incentive for us to develop newer technologies. And as a service provider, they have been very helpful to uh, Professor Satya also. And he has uh, been CTO at several uh, uh, startups and all, and uh, a very accomplished person from Europe. And I think we have been blessed to have him in our team to lead us for the actual mission of Cloudlet. Then, uh, this I don't need introduction process. Yeah. Uh, he has been in the Carnegie Mellon University. He was the one who wrote the case of VM-based Cloudlet for mobile computing. That was the one, 2009 when he started on this and today we see the reality of the cloudlet at the edge. Uh, he was the original founder of the Andrew file system, so he has been in the distributed file system, distributed computing, and several of his uh, students have been all over places from Dropbox to everywhere. So he's an eminent personality and we like to see him bring to us the vision of cloudlet and this is the time for me to hand over to him. Thanks. I've got this. Thank you very much, Prakash. So what I'd like to do is to just introduce you to Cloudlets, tell you what they are, why they're important, why you should care about them, and then I'm going to turn it over to the rest of my team to take it forward. So what is a Cloudlet? A Cloudlet is a small data center. Think of an enormous data center that has shrunk into maybe a suitcase sized, maybe a rack, maybe even smaller, but the critical properties are that it's located one wireless hop away from mobile devices. So it's very, very close, the latency is low, and any wireless improvements, whether in latency or bandwidth, immediately translate into application perceived improvement. On the other hand, a cloudlet does not suffer from some of the challenges that mobile devices have to suffer from. You don't have to worry about the weight. You don't have to worry about the battery life. You don't have to worry about small size, heat dissipation. All of these challenges are challenges you have to cope with when designing a smartphone, a Google Glass, or any of these other kinds of uh, systems. So as you'll see in the rest of this talk, it's a catalyst for brand new mobile applications. Here's the deployment model that we envision for Cloudlets. 
At the top, in the cloud, are unmodified cloud services, what exists today. And at the edges, located very close to mobile devices, are what we think of as internet infrastructure. In other words, you don't have an iOS cloudlet, you don't have a uh, Android cloudlet, you don't have a M Windows cloudlet. You think of it the same way you think of Wi-Fi infrastructure. It's a cloudlet. And for the same kinds of reasons of multi-tenancy, isolation, et cetera, that matter in the cloud, those same factors also apply at the edge. So we can see coexisting, possibly untrusted backends of different mobile services running on the same cloudlet. So one way to think of what this is, this picture is, is you're all familiar with CDNs. Akamai made them famous, but many companies have them. Think of cloudlets as defining a CDN for computation. Whereas CDNs originally were created to do data caching, cloudlets do for computation what CDNs have done for data. So why should you care about cloudlets? In one slide, let me try to summarize for you. There's a lot of detail on this that you can look up and we have plenty of resources to share with you. But let me just distill for you the essence of why cloudlets are important. First, most important reason is latency. I'm going to drill down into this in just a second. But it's also important from the point of view of bandwidth. Imagine all of you in this room wearing GoPro or Google Glass or some such device. How much would the total cumulative bandwidth ingress bandwidth of all that video be if a significant fraction of Tokyo or any other large city, and whether it is mobile or fixed infrastructure, the total transmission of video data into the cloud would be very substantial. What cloudlets let you do is to push the analytics to the edge. So the video only has to travel as far as the cloudlet, it's analyzed there, and it can be stored there in raw but encrypted form. Later, if an examination of the extracted analytics suggests that you should go look at the data, you can do that at least for a certain period of time that you're able to buffer the raw video. So bandwidth is a second critical, critical reason. The third reason has to do with privacy. Um, it is the case today that Concerns about privacy are starting to be a big source of slowdown in the deployment of the Internet of Things. If your water consumption can be monitored, and through machine learning, we can infer every time we flushed, you flushed a commode in your home, and I can therefore infer all kinds of patterns about the state of your health. That's not something most people want to reveal to the world, but that's what's possible today. The ability to place privacy enforcement software close to the point of data capture is an important capability that cloudlets provide. And last but not least, cloud computing presumes the existence of connectivity to the cloud. But as you all know, with the emergence of uh, denial of service attacks and various other forms of attacks, the ability to get to the cloud may be compromised in the future. What you need is for cloud services, something like what you use for power. You purchase a uninterruptible power supply, you plug it in, and for brief periods of failure, you can continue operating. Cloudlets provide you a platform on which those cloud services that have been suitably modified can use the cloudlet as a fallback location. So these four critical usage models of cloudlets are going to drive its future. But latency was the most important and original motivating reason, and that's what I'm going to focus on. So does it really matter? Let me give you the answer. Suppose you're writing an augmented reality application. You use your smartphone, use the sensors like the camera on it, or the uh, accelerometer, you transmit this data 
to the backend software. And then it is analyzed there, and some result is shipped back. For example, the name of the building that's in the image is an example of a simple augmented reality application. You could run the backend on a cloudlet connected by Wi-Fi or 4G LTE, or you can place it in Amazon uh, in the Amazon data center, either in the east or west or Europe or uh, Asia, or you can run the whole thing locally. All of these are possibilities. Now, these experiments were conducted in Pittsburgh, and the closest Amazon site, six milliseconds away, is Amazon East. Amazon West, which is in Portland, is about 80 milliseconds away, and the others are much further. So look at this curve. What it shows here is in milliseconds on the x-axis, and here is a fraction of the results that come back sooner than that many milliseconds. So if you're looking at 80% of the results using a cloudlet come back in less than 80 milliseconds. Whereas if you use Amazon East, 80% of the results come back in about 250 milliseconds. And things get progressively worse, as you can see. And running it purely on the mobile device, even though there's no wireless transmission involved, is still worse. And the reason has to do with the computational power of the smartphone relative to what you can put in a rack as a cloudlet. The picture looks roughly the same, but shifted to the right if you use 4G LTE. But in all other respects, the results are quite consistent. Now this is what the user experiences in terms of crisp computation. Basically, if you use the Cloudlet, the augmented reality app is really crisp and snappy, and that's the user experience that you want. However, using a Cloudlet is also enormously beneficial in terms of battery life, in terms of the amount of energy consumed on the mobile device to perform the operation. So if you look at this, if you look at augmented reality, which is the other column, performing the entire operation on the mobile device for one image, it's of 5.4 joules. If I ship the image to the cloudlet, I consume Wi-Fi energy transmission costs and reception, but I don't pay the cost of computation, which is done by the cloudlet. The total amount of energy used is only 0.6 joules, dramatically lower. If I do the same computation in Amazon East, identical first wireless hop, just the fact that the result takes longer to come back causes the energy consumption to increase by a factor of five. So the savings are huge. Of course, it depends on the kind of application and You'll have to do the experimental analysis for your specific application to understand, but the big picture is pretty clear. So, so far what I've described to you other than augmented reality are pretty well-known, well-understood application classes. What new applications are enabled by this world? I want to give you just an insight into one new class of applications. So imagine you are wearing some device, mobile device, like Google Glass or uh, uh, HoloLens or any of these other augmented reality devices. Everything seen by your sensors, your camera, your microphone, your accelerometer, is transmitted to the cloudlet. It sees what you see. It hears what you hear. But faster than you can think, it computes on that sensor data and whispers in your ear some useful guidance that could possibly help you. Think of GPS navigation. Maybe to get you to this building, use your GPS on your smartphone or in your automobile. Think of the step-by-step -step guidance that it gives you. Could we expand that to other kinds of tasks and other kinds of sensor data. That is the world that this opens up. Let me just show you one example to impress upon you the significance of latency. 
of how this could work. There are many example applications we have built of this kind. This is just one. Our Google Glass-based ping pong assistant helps the user to play better ping pong by whispering whether the user should hit to the left or to the right. The hint is based on the observed ball position and opponent position. Left. Left. Okay, you get the picture. How did that work? Every video frame is analyzed using computer vision to find the ball and the opponent. And then it is compared with the position of the ball and the opponent in the previous frame. From it is calculated the trajectory of the ball and the trajectory of the opponent. And based on that, in real time, you get guidance to hit the ball to the left or right. Simple application, but I just want you to think about how much computation is involved and how critical real-time response is. So this is the world that high-intensity compute close by can do for you. This is only one of many future use cases we envision. Think of going to IKEA, buying a kit, as to getting printed instructions, giving step-by-step -step guidance. Troubleshooting industrial machinery is often a very complicated task. Trying to get guidance step-by-step -step would be very powerful. Medical training. You know, that's not even a real patient thing. That's just a mannequin. To allow a student, who's this guy, to learn without this expensive doctor standing by is a kind of learning that is possible with this. For elder care, I know that in Japan it's a significant, certainly in the United States it's significant, the use of medical devices to get your blood pressure, sugar level, et cetera, et cetera, is very important to keeping healthcare costs down. But if you don't install these and do the readings well, the readings are meaningless. And so getting guidance to do that is important. And then my favorite is to help you lead a healthier lifestyle just as you're about to eat that donut, to yell in your ear, stop, don't do that. Okay, so our vision you said OpenStack on cloudlets, whether it's at home, in your car, in the cell tower, in an aircraft, is the way that we're going to achieve the vision described. And to tell you how, I'm going to turn it over to Rolf. Thanks a lot. Can you just have the... Okay. So good morning to all of you, warm welcome. First of all, I would like to thank you for having me here, considering that I come from a different universe, from the telecom world, and that I'm a complete newbie to the OpenStack Summit, right? So thanks for allowing me to talk. Let me expand that a little bit, this vision. Um, we have just heard a little bit uh, also from a perspective from the telecoms industry, right? What we would like to enable is really put cloudlets everywhere. As uh, Satya has just said, we would like to put it in base stations, we would like to put it in core networks, uh, DSL boxes, Wi-Fi hotspots, um, and uh, basically offer storage and compute power everywhere on the planet, right next to the user. I think this is the key, that we believe that low latency and the other drivers that have been mentioned um, make the need, inform the need to actually put that um, edge infrastructure in place. And to be clear, this concept has to be open, right? It has to be open also in the sense of that any application can come and use it. It has to be open in the sense of that it's bearer independent, whether it's Wi-Fi, whether it's 3G, 4G, uh, Zigbee, whatever. This infrastructure, this compute and storage at the edge has to work for all of these uh, um, situations. And um, this also explains why we believe that OpenStack is the key component in all of this, because what we would like to offer is a platform that is a multi-tenant um, uh, environment that any application can come and can uh, utilize. 
And therefore, we believe that OpenStack is the ideal candidate to, to, to actually play in that, in that environment. Now, we have talked already about applications. You know, we, we, we can even further extend the list we have just heard. I just wanted to mention maybe two other areas that have not been addressed. Uh, that is, for example, assisted driving. Imagine you drive a car and you get information about the road in, right in front of you in real time from the roadside. And you maybe even get a, uh, an overlay on your windscreen allowing you to look, to look through fog, to look through trucks driving in front of you, or you'll just get warnings at an early time. We can also imagine drone control. You, know, you see all of these little things flying around everywhere, but you also need information about the direct uh, environment in near real time. Um, so last not least also, I guess, online gamers get more and more sensitive about latency. We can imagine that they, they set up their local edge server and their local uh, cloud cloud component in order to get the best performance. Now, from a business perspective, right, who are the players that, that should act here? First of all, obviously, there is a communication service provider like Vodafone, the company I work for. Um, you know, they provide the infrastructure and the networks and all that. Above that, uh, obviously, there has to be a, a, an edge cloud service provider right, that offers c components at the edge and manages it from the back end. We will need some central components like a registry of uh, cloudlets being available and their capabilities. And also, obviously, the uh, uh, application provider has to come into play and has to offer a three-tier architecture here where he has an application component sitting on a mobile device or whatever this, uh, where this application runs on, where he has a component running at the edge component and then uh, the, the backend cloud components. Right? And now the question is, you know, is there interest, is there value in edge computing for all of these players? And if we, we have done the, uh, the value chain analysis and we come to the conclusion that actually all of these um, uh, companies and all of these uh, value chain segments have an advantage from it. If you look at the telecom infrastructure providers and the, uh, the cloud technology providers, I mean, they have definitely an uh, advantage in terms of you know, new products, new services, uh, innovation image and so on. Network providers like uh, uh, Motorphone, like my, my company, they are very interested because they, they can extend their um, offerings into the cloud space. I mean, they know the, they, they own the edge and the network anyhow, right? Why not putting cloud infrastructure into that and uh, um, monetize it? And then, of course, the um, application service providers and the um, developers, ap application developers themselves, they can offer a superior and actually a disruptive change in customer experience based on edge computing. So, for overall, we feel that the, this proposition has advantages for, for all players in the value chain. We just have to bring them all together and make it happen. Now, in order to make this happen, we have formed an um, open edge computing initiative, really with parties from the uh, telecoms world, service provider, infrastructure providers. And we also reach out to IT players now to really, um, to really drive this ecosystem around edge computing, because it will not happen by itself. Right? There's a bit of a chicken egg problem. If low latency applications are there, the infrastructure will not uh, be put in place. If the infrastructure is not in place, the application developers don't work. Right? So we have to bring all the parties together, namely the application providers, the infrastructure providers, as well as the service providers, and you know, make sure that this is a, a coordinated uh, uh, development we, we drive. And as part of the key targets is really of, of this initiative, also reach out into, into your community, into OpenStack to say, you know, don't you want to join that initiative in terms of, uh, you know, bring OpenStack um, from maybe a data center environment basically everywhere on the planet, right? Don't you want to enable OpenStack to run also in, in environments maybe that, that has not been thought of in the past. So th this is the, the invitation to all of you to say, uh, you know, is, is, is that a sensible target? We don't know, right? We, we, we want to listen to you. Is this a sensible target to, to uh, you know, utilize OpenStack also outside of data centers? We will also uh, reach out to application providers. This is very important because if there is 
no applications, you know, th 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 there is no business at the end of the day. We have started already developing demonstrators. We have seen this uh, ping pong assistant and we, we strongly believe that this is the right way to, to engage with the application provider industry and explain to them the, the opportunities they, they could have here. Obviously, we will liaise with um, operators and with cloud service providers in order to bring them to the table as well. So this is the uh, Open Edge Computing Initiative. Now, currently we have Intel, Huawei, and Vodafone as uh, key players in there. Carnegie Mellon is the academic partner we have, and, but this initiative is open to, to, to other companies, to other partners. Uh, you know, those who really have to, willing to contribute, uh, contribute uh, uh, significantly to it. But to be clear, this is not just these three companies. Um, behind that, there is a, a whole initiative in the telecoms world already. Um, there is, um, I mean, this is how telecom industry works. If, if they see a new, new opportunity, they start standardizing, right? So there is an Etsy standardization group called Mobile Edge Computing. Uh, 50 companies are currently playing there, mainly telecoms companies, but also some IT companies are there. Um, you know, and, and, and they, they very actively drive that forward. They see this also as, as one step into 5G, the next generation um, mobile networks, where the latency is coming from 4G latency of 10 to 15 milliseconds on the air interface down to one millisecond. So basically they, they, they see this also as, as, a, as a step in, in, uh, in that direction. Um, and just to say, you know, this is not uh, three companies trying to do something. This is a whole um, uh, uh, um, collection of global companies that, that would like to uh, drive that. But what the Open Edge initi Initiative tries to do is really to say, we reach out to, to you guys and to the application industry to make you aware, to bring you um, into all of this and to make you involved. Now, just quickly, my last slide before I hand over to the technical part. Um, we, we seek your support here, right? We believe OpenStack is the platform in the cloud world and we would like to make it the platform of choice for edge computing. And uh, hence, uh, you know, we, we are here, we, we, uh, we offer that to you. Uh, you know, we have developed something and uh, you will hear that um, details about that in a minute, but we, we, we seek developer support, you know, people who, who help us making this really integral part of OpenStack that any, any OpenStack release is enabled for the edge, is enabled for applications to actually uh, um, uh, discover it and actually utilize it. Um, we will, as a next step, we, we want to develop a reference uh, platform that actually does it, uh, offer the services end to end. Uh, and at the end of the day, we have to ensure that there is a smooth customer experience. We also um, invite companies to join, right, and to help and um, uh, just as a, as, a, as, a, as a main message to you, you know, join us to bring OpenStack from the data center out into the world, basically everywhere. With that, I hand over to Prakash, who will guide you into the implementation we have already done. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ralph and uh, uh, Professor Satya. Uh, now the vi vision portion and the mission portion is over. Let's get into execution. So what do we have here is how do we execute? So the first thing we think in this world of OpenStack is API, APIs, APIs. What do I have? So we do have uh, Cloudlet and Cloudlet, which is visioned by Professor Satya, falls under open edge computing currently. That's why we call, we have to name an API. So we call it as Open Edge Computing API, which consists of the Open Edge Computing Cloudlet API, which is related to the computational and st storage aspects, we believe, and the communication API, which is related to network. Because we say network is computing, be that. So we need to have that networking to allow different uh, APIs to interact with each other. So given that, we start with Cloudlet API, so we have to think of that back end being Himalaya and this being the Fuji mountain. So something like a huge one and a uh, closer one. So whatever is closest to you, you connect to it from the device. So you have a device and you want to connect to the uh, edge rather than connecting to the back end, which is far off. So if you connect 
then once you connect, then you have to start engaging in the APIs. What do you do? Oh, you want to create a VM. Well, why are you creating? Nova does it. Yes, Nova does it, but Nova does it for a standard of the shelf. And we do want to standard of the shelf, but we need a little more than what it does in terms of latency, bandwidth, in terms of privacy, in terms of security, in terms of the various values we professed. So that's the reason that API should not only be just simple API of, like if you have a cloud and you can create everything in the cloud using NOAA, I can create a VM, I can take an application, push it into it, I can run it, then why do I need this? Not really, because we do have certain constraints which we profess and we want to attain that. Therefore, this API, which is the cloud-led API, OEC cloud-led API we mentioned, those have to contain those elements. And that's the, that's the element which we are uh, pointing here. And the, so the other portion is, of course, to the COM layer, the communication API. So we are talking about the device API because there is a client portion of it. Without a device, uh, what do you see? A user having a device can access. So therefore, to connect to those applications which are very constrained, we use this device and obviously as a service provider if it is everything is device managed i trigger at the device and then get everything done and then i'm done then it's easy but the other end somebody has to pay for it somebody has subscribed for it somebody pays for it so there is a management aspect and that's why the service provider would like to manage from the back end either in the cloud as a registry or at the edge with a registry so that somebody can uh, charge for it measure it so those are the aspects which the API should cover. So moving on, I'll now get into what APIs we do have currently. So first thing is, is this working piece? Sure, it's a working piece. We, uh, as CMU started this almost in Icehouse, Juno, and now they have pushed into uh, Kilo. And our goal is, it's, you know, OpenStack moves six months, it is so fast rate that by the time you blink, six months is over and you are already falling behind so our goal is right now chasing for last three uh, open stack releases we have been chasing and we have come to kilo now liberty is released on 18th and so we want to push to liberty but before we move that what do we have in api items so the bottom two api are the most important apis vm synthesis and vm handoff these are the two which are live these are offline, other three are there. Those are supporting APIs, but the bottom two are the main. So what is synthesis and what is handoff? So if you look at a glance cat catalog, you have image. So you have an image, so we have a base image. Of course, we don't want a very, very big image. We want a, a image which is footprint wise is small so that we can easily use that. That's one criteria. The other criteria is once you have that, how do you store it, okay? And once you have stored it, if you, if you run a VM, in NOAA terms, if you run a VM, that is instantiation. Once you instantiate, you have to run an application on it. So what is the image? If I take an image, image in terms of computer science is either a disk with a hash table, and then similarly, you have got a memory with a hash table. Now, that's the process view of the VM as such, as an image level. Now, I run something on it, it creates some additional context. So those contexts could be compute context, storage context, network context. These have to be uh, preserved in that. So the delta is the overlay. That is, if you run a standard gold image, and then on top of it, you run a process, that process creates something delta. That is the delta we need to collect. So that's what. So normally in data center, what we do, we do a live migration. Here is the VM, migrate it there. It starts running there. Of course, if it is live, well and good. If it is not, then you, the user's perception is you, they have lost something. So that you should not lose something. That's the live migration. But in this case, what we have done is there is a format in which the VM is. So you create an overlay, and that overlay has four components disk incremental and memory incremental shot. And then when you run on top some application and then synthesize it back, 
then that is what is the recovering, the snapshot. So you have a snapshot, you recover, you add some process, and that delta is added. And then, then you want to move it. Like, I am moving from here to there. My cloudlet should move from one edge to another edge. For that to happen, I need to run it, uh, stop it, take the delta, push the delta to the other end, start a new VM, and then add the delta. And by moving, you're changing the location, so you're going to lose some of the, uh, what do you call the uh, st uh, t uh, network states and all. And so we have to make sure those are all preserved. And this should not be perceived by the end user from the device that there is some effect of that. Like if I am not able to see something, I am losing something, then I have not made my uh, latency bandwidth sufficient to make that happen. So that's the goal behind this. So I will just move on to the next. That shows actually that this is what we had in Kilo. And this is what we propose that we want to have. Like we have not completed registration. We want to make sure it is registered. And then we want to do some additional stuff like create an edge group so that we can have two VMs while moving. If it is a group, if one fails, active, passive, passive, active, those kinds of things are included. And obviously, we want to uh, attach, detach, or we call it as uh, link and link. So those are the certain APIs which we would like to have. Okay, And that's the goal. And let's see how we move on that. So the future is much more uh, than what we have described. But at this stage, we have to be grounded that the basic what we have is what we have. And we would like to see that this also goes into the, uh, the APIs are able to be exploited in the future in the 4G and 4.5G and the 5G, which is coming. And that will require some kind of a state management. And that's, we will uh, just, I'll skip it. This is, but this is required as part of it. This is what we have state of OEC current. So open edge computing, cloudlet, currently in Kilo, adopts the mobile edge computing concept, which is there in the HC. And the OpenStack APIs are there. It is running through the NOAA API currently, and it is using the messaging RabbitMQ to send the message to the compute. And in the compute, you have the drivers being replaced. NOAA driver is being replaced by Cloudlet. And then it is also managed with, through the hypervisor. In this case, we have used KVM. So whatever Libbert has got, it has been um, uh, what do you call the class of service it gives that has been inherited by the cloudlet and additional capability like synthesis and handoff are added to that. So this is what the API is and this is how uh, currently we are managing. And for the, uh, for the sake of uh, time, I would say that at this time, I would say that we are at the end of it. But we do have Kirang Ha. Can you raise your hand? Kirang Ha is the architect. Uh, he is in at CMU, and uh, he is doing his PhD, and he has uh, been the architect of this. He has helped us build this, and we would like that. There are some challenges he faced, as you can see. Portability of VM is one of them, which was handled by him. Like you have different uh, Intel processor. If it is Sandy Bridge or it is something else, then you have that. Uh, if the hardware changes at the bottom then the states are not maintained. So we have a portability of VM issue. We similarly have a network stage issue, whether you can, um, state can be maintained or not maintained based on the MAC address changing or the IP address changing. So those are the challenges. Plus, we also need QEMU and KVM, which are not up to date for us to really use it efficiently for low latency. That needs enhancement. And the testing of multi nodes. So when we hand off, we have one open stack one VM, another open stack, the same VM to be recreated. So we need credentials, etc., etc. So those are the challenges we are facing, and we look forward that we should be able to. Uh, sorry, we should be able to uh, get this over. And our plan, the last uh, kilo of time frame, was we tried to do whatever best we have within our own resources, and we look forward to this uh, DevOps support from the open stack community and. And the essence of this is, this is our goal. We want to deliver OpenStack in next Mitaka to cover the gap from Liberty to Mitaka. And for that, uh, we need your support. So anybody who is willing to participate, uh, we went to the OpenStack, uh, what do you call the compute uh, team, and they told us that we should better have our own uh, cloudlet as a new module. 
But to do that, we need a lot of preparation, a lot of help from the community, and we look forward to all of you who are in the attendance as well as other companies who would help us in doing that, and especially the application service providers as well as the uh, telecom providers and uh, infrastructure providers, all of them be welcome to help us. And I think at this stage, I would uh, just give time for the Q&A, and here is the uh, detail. Please ask any questions, and we have, uh, yeah, go ahead, Susan. I have a question. When you say module, in this setting, you have to be on module. Can you explain what that is? So what, project? yes. Okay. What it means is we do have NOAA as a project. We wanted to tag on to NOAA as a microservice API so that we can just use existing API. However, they consider that changes to the API will impact the development in the Mitaka cycle, what they are in they suggest that why don't you send a, uh, start a new, uh, uh, what do you call, a module called Cloudlet. And we are consulting uh, uh, Kyle, Misri, and other people, and uh, we hope we'll be able to do that. Question, sir? Can you, can you go to the, uh, can you go to the mic, please? Everybody go to the mic for questions. Please line up if you have. Yeah. Hi, Nigel Cook. Uh, the question is, um, the APIs that you have, um, and all the lifecycle operations around VMs and so forth, how does that relate to the interfaces that are exposed in NFVI? So, so they're also, you know, have a sort of a similar bent because of the telecom flavor. Is there any overlap there, or are these not covered in that API set? So the question is, the NFV APIs, whatever they have interfaces, IFA, under IFA uh, interfaces, and then those are those reflected in our uh, implementation? So the answer to that is OpenStack de facto standard doesn't follow the standard what the uh, HC community defines. However, OpenFV is the platform which is trying to bridge the gap. And as a open edge computing, we are still very early in the day, we just want simple API. So at this time, we are not trying to address any gaps. We hope OpenFV will be able to cover that for us, and then we can probably uh, leverage on that. So we are at a very nascent stage at this stage to consider. But we do follow that. We are looking at MEC to provide the normative API references, and they don't have. So what we will do is we will provide and try to influence MEC to adopt that. That's what we see right now. Is, right. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. OK. Any questions from the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, no, come come in front. Uh, yeah. Instead of uh, packaging the apps in VMs, have you considered containers? Uh, very good question. Uh, OK, put it this way, we do have a roadmap for that. But at this stage, uh, in this year, in 2015, we are not taking them. But 2016, maybe March time frame is what we plan to do that. We do have a roadmap for it. Yes, you are welcome to join us in helping us there. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we, we, we seek participation from everybody. We, nothing runs without containers these days, right? And the faster, the better. Yeah, so the, the security aspect is something which we need to address. But otherwise, I think we are fine with that. Any other questions, please? Uh, are we running out of time? Are we in time? We, we are in time? Done? OK. So I think uh, if in the absence of any questions, I will just announce a few things before. Uh, uh, the first thing is there is a HTTP colon open edge computing dot org. Ashley, Ashley at the back, stand up. Ashley, Ashley. Said. So Ashley has uh, already installed. Uh, inaugurated this, you are most welcome to go to http openhcomputing.org. We have all the details for you, including the references to the codes and what we want to do, etc. And uh, we thank, yeah, go ahead, you have anything? I was just trying to answer this earlier question about any kind of tie in with uh, the Mitaka cycle and what the
Exactly. Exactly. There is a KVM for NFE project under Op NFE, which deals with the uh, portability of VM and etc. in a computing sense. And that's led by Intel and other folks. And uh, we uh, welcome everybody to join there to help uh, get there. And then there is another thing which I want to. Um, there are many people behind this. Don't think that we are the we are only the showpieces. The actual work behind Ashley has managed to do the Open Computing Edge dot org site. Then we have Kiryang Ha, our architect. He will be available. He will demo. If you want to see the demonstration, he will be available in Huawei booth P14 <coughs> at the marketplace at 11 o'clock. You can uh, watch the uh, thing. What the code is. What is our state of uh, uh, under Kilo, what we have developed and how the POC is done. He can show you the migration and all. It's a cool thing to look at. And if you want to join the coding and all. Uh, Gunther Klaas is not here. He's in Vodafone. But he is also one of the architect behind it. And he works with Rolf uh, in the Europe. And then we have Padmanatham Pillai Babu, we call him. Babu is uh, a great uh, supporter of this. And he is on the compute side. He has tried to see how to accelerate how to get the latency lower and uh, lower and lower. That's the target of 3 to 30 millisecond. We say 30 millisecond for LTE, 3 millisecond for the Wi-Fi. We want to push it sub millisecond if we can. That will be the 5G then. So we have great support from all of the players here. And we look forward to your participation. And come and join Kiryangha at 11 PM at the P14. 11, 11 a.m. Sorry, 11 a.m. I'm, I'm, I'm still there. <laughs> OK. So 11 a.m. P14 Huawei booth marketplace. Please. Thank you very much. I think we should quit. The other team is coming in. And thanks to the OpenStack community for allowing us to do this. Sorry for not mentioning that.